Good morning. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. So as, as you can tell, I am not physically present at the conference this morning. And you may be wondering where I am at. So when the pandemic hit Europe, I came to join my family on our farm in central Michigan in the United States. So when you, when you ask someone from Michigan where they're from, they will most likely put their palm in front of your face and point. And that's because the, the state of Michigan is shaped like an open hand. It's, it's a peninsula surrounded by, surrounded by water, surrounded by the Great Lakes. So Detroit is over here, Ann Arbor, which is home to the state's flagship university, is right here. Lansing, which is the state capital, is right here. Uh, Kalamazoo, which is home to Western, Un Western Michigan University, is over here. Our farm is just outside a small town uh, named Clare. So Clare is a, it's actually an Amish community. Uh, and the Amish, as you, you may know, are a religious group that was actually founded in Switzerland. Um, so uh, I, I telework uh, to the ILO headquarters uh, every day. Uh, I start at 6.30 in the morning and I work through breakfast and lunch and I get off work at 2.30 in the afternoon and, and then I change hats. I, I mean, I, I literally change hats. And I, I go out and work on the farm for another four or five hours and, until it gets dark. So I'm, you know, I'm, uh, I'm putting in some long days, but I'm, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity to speak with you about the history of participatory evaluation. I'm, I'm not going to try and give you a comprehensive, uh, overview of, of, of the topic. I'm, I'm actually going to identify a few dates and events that I think were important, and then I will discuss uh, the implication that it had for the profession. Our thinking on the topic of participation has evolved. So 30 years ago, participation was actually seen as being something undesirable. For example, before coming to work at the ILO, I worked at a place called the Evaluation Center on the campus of Western Michigan University. And my supervisor was a person named Daniel Stuffelbeam. So those of you who know your evaluation history will recognize that name. Dan was one of the pioneers of modern day evaluation. He developed the SIP approach. He was the first chair of the Joint Committee on Standards for Educational Evaluation, which was actually the, the precursor of the Swiss Evaluation Society's standards. And he innovated using standards to do meta-evaluation or evaluation of an evaluation. So it, it may surprise you to learn that Dan was actually against the, I like totally, totally against the idea of participation. He thought that evaluators who use this approach abdicate their authority for setting questions, for collecting and analyzing data, and for reporting results to the participants of the projects that were being evaluated. 
he saw this as being a very dangerous, uh, a very dangerous trend because he thought that it, it undermined the independence of evaluation. And Dan wasn't the only one who thought that way. So I have, I have looked at the history and I think I have, uh, I think I have identified the, the tipping point, the, the point of inflection, the, the shift in paradigms, the sea change, if you will, when the profession begrudgingly came to accept participatory evaluation. And I want to tell you that story. So during the 80s, during the 1980s and into the 90s, a paradigm war raged within the evaluation profession that pitted proponents of quantitative evaluation based on a positivistic paradigm against proponents of qualitative evaluation based on a naturalistic paradigm. And right in the middle of that, of the paradigm war, the American Evaluation Association elected a person named David Fetterman to be its president. So David was the director of the master's degree program in policy analysis and evaluation at the prestigious Stanford University. And as the AEA president, he was also the annual meeting program chair. And it was his prerogative to select the theme for that year's conference. And the theme that he selected was empowerment evaluation. Empowerment evaluation is an extreme form of participatory evaluation that was developed by Fetterman and his colleagues. The goal of empowerment evaluation is to help organizations to improve through self-evaluation. The approach provides organizations with the tools and the knowledge that they need to, to conduct their own evaluations rather than to rely on external evaluators. I attended the conference over which David presided. It was, it was like 27 years ago. So I, you know, I don't really remember a lot of details, but what I do remember was the zeitgeist of the meeting. It, it was very contentious. There were many evaluators with long experience who were very vocal in their criticism of this new approach. And Fetterman and his colleagues were very much on the defensive. Well, after the conference, the flagship journal of the association published a special issue entitled the qualitative quantitative debate, new perspectives. And in that volume, Dan Stuffelbeam published an article disparaging emp empowerment evaluation. He called it inadequate philosophically, theoretically, and practically. And he also referred to it as being confused and totally wrong. Well, in the following volume, David published a response to Dan in which he gently insinuated that the reason that Dan didn't like empowerment evaluation was because David is Jewish. David wrote that he had recently conducted a workshop in the Midwestern part of the United States, where I am right now. 
and that some participants were relieved when they learned that Jews do not have horns. He, David went on to assure Dan that the empowerment evaluation approach also did not have horns. Well, that ended the debate there and then. To be fair to Dan, I think that he was not anti-Semitic. As a matter of fact, one of his closest friends and colleagues was a person named David Nebo, who went on to organize the Israeli Association for Program Evaluation. That association is to Israel what the Swiss Evaluation Society is to Switzerland. Nonetheless, after that exchange, I, I am not able to find any more substantive public opposition to empowerment evaluation specifically and to participatory evaluation in general. So thinking about participatory evaluation has actually evolved here in Switzerland too. This is reflected in the Swiss Evaluation Society's evaluation standards. Well, how would I know that? Well, in the year 2000, while I was still working at the Evaluation Center, I edit, edited a publication entitled The Program Evaluation Standards in International Settings. And one of the chapters was written by the Swiss Evaluation Society's own Thomas Widmer, Charles Lander, and Nicole Bachmann. In their chapter, they, des they described the Swiss Evaluation Standards that would be published the following year. There was, according to them, there was a standard that made reference to taking the interests and needs of clients and stakeholders into account. But there was also a standard that made reference to averting possible attempts by stakeholders to curtailing evaluation activities or to bias or misapplying the results. There was also a standard that said that Reporting was to be guarded against distortions by any stakeholder group. So I think that this clearly demonstrates that there was some distrust of participation. In 2016, Christian Rufli, Reinhard Zwedler, and Martin Cossy led an effort to revise the Swiss evaluation standards. These new standards call for stakeholders to be inspired to engage adequately in the process and to make use of the process as well as the results. So I think that you can see that in 15 short years, there has been a remarkable change in attitude. I triangulated that finding with information from a search of the ILO's evaluation report database called iEval Discovery. I might add that our database is open to the public. It's accessible to the public. You can do your own searches. So I did a search of evaluations of projects that were funded by the, the Swiss cooperation, which used or which included the, the term participatory. And what I found was that prior to 2008, there were no reports in our database containing that term. In 2008, there was one 
report that used the term. In 2010, there was another. But in the most recent years, there are three or four reports every year that contain the term participatory. Times have changed. As a matter of fact, I, I think participatory evaluation is coming to be accepted globally. I think this is reflected uh, in the way that the United Nations system has come to embrace the approach. For example, the, the International Labor Organization, where I work, per participation and sensitivity to diversity are principles that guide the ILO's tripartite approach. And we've come to look at it as being one of our comparative strengths. Our evaluation policy guidelines encourage core stakeholders to participate as early as possible in the planning stage. This creates a common understanding about the purpose and helps to ensure that the evaluation will be relevant to their needs. It also helps to ensure that the methodology will be appropriate. But perhaps the most important benefit is that participation offers stakeholders the opportunity to take ownership of the evaluation. And that promotes uptake and use of the, evaluations, of the evaluation results. Engaging stakeholders in evaluation also helps, to also helps to build individual evaluation capacity. And this rolls up into national evaluation capacity. And in the era of the 2030 agenda, national evaluation capacity is more important than ever. It enables countries to monitor and to evaluate their progress toward the sustainable development goals. So as I was discussing the content of my presentation with the conference organizers, they told me that you might be interested in my own personal opinions on participation. So at, at the risk of seeming immodest, I'm, I'm going to share some, you know, some personal things with you. So one of the things for which I am known in the profession is a series of seven journal articles that link aspects of Eastern philosophy to evaluation. And all of these articles were published in the Ideas to be Considered section of the Journal of Multidisciplinary Evaluation. The, the first article that I published dealt with, well, it, it proposed an Eastern paradigm of evaluation. And in that article, I dealt with ontological issues. Ontology, as as you know, uh, is uh, the study of the nature of things. The second article that I, I published together with my wife proposed a uh, proposed the insight evaluation uh, proposed a new approach called the insight evaluation approach, and. In this article, we, we actually dealt with epistemological issues. Epistemology, as, as you know, is, uh, deals with how we come to know the nature of things. And then the third article that I published dealt with uh, methods for collecting data based on an Eastern paradigm of evaluation. The, the other four articles, the, the other four were just kind of one-off articles with 
with uh, exotic titles like how the E King or Book of Changes can inform Western notions of theory of change. Or the Bhagavad Gita, history's first manual on results-based management. And, and perhaps one of my favorites was uh, the impact, Im impact evaluation based on Buddhist principles. Well, one of, the, one of the principles that is pervasive in all the lines of, of Eastern philosophy that I have studied, whether it's Buddhism or Hinduism or Taoism, is the notion of letting go. This is often referred to as non-attachment. Non-attachment is a state in which a person overcomes their attachment to desire for things, people, or concepts of the world. So I, I think that some of us evaluators become so attached to our work that we, we don't want to allow the participation of others because we think it might take the evaluation in a different direction than the one that we had originally foreseen. So over the years, I have come to be, I have come to become more comfortable in loosening my control over an evaluation because I have come to believe that if I let go and I encourage others to participate to the fullest extent possible, I may be able to attain heightened perspectives in my work. And if not heightened perspective, if not heightened perspectives, at least broader perspectives. So I, I, I want to thank you for your kind attention this morning. I've, I see that my time is up. I've saved a few minutes for question and answer. So I, I will now join you live to have, a, a, to have some further discussions with you.